Hello everyone, welcome again, thanks for coming. Those of you that uh, read the Australian this morning would have seen the outgoing US um, Deputy Secretary of State talk about defense uh, in Australia as being a very complex issue and very troubling. This was in an interview which was in the Australian this morning, so obviously uh, tonight's meeting, which follows on our last week's meeting, where we had quite a focus on defense and the Asian century and so on, is obviously very timely. Uh, I'm not going to chair tonight's meeting. I'm going to hand over to uh, Jeff, because Jeff was the High Commissioner in New Zealand, and it's appropriate that he uh, introduces our distinguished guest from Wellington. Thanks very much, Colin, and uh, it's uh, a great pleasure for me this evening to uh, chair the meeting and to welcome John McKinnon to speak to us. John is an extraordinarily accomplished uh, New Zealand diplomat and government official. He uh, has served as, uh, most recently, as New Zealand Secretary of Defence for six years, before that Ambassador in China. Uh, before that, so he knows us very well, he served in the High Commission in Canberra. And now he's got the very important position of Executive Director of the Asia New Zealand Foundation, which is a, a body which now, by now has quite a history, uh, been in existence for 20 years, promoting all aspects of Australia, of New Zealand's dealings with and relations with Asia. Uh, of course, uh, those who have been at recent meetings know that uh, we've been talking a bit about Australia and Asia, and last week a discussion on the uh, Australia Century, uh, Asia Century white paper. Uh, John is very familiar with that. And uh, I think it'll be very uh, instructive for us to see a New Zealand perspective on dealing with Asia, uh, what, what, what's worked for them, how they appreciate the situation we're both looking at, and also perhaps uh, a comment or two from John on our approach. So with no more ado, can I ask you to welcome John King. Good evening to you all, and uh, thank you, Jeff, for that uh, very warm welcome. I'm, I'm very happy indeed to be here in Sydney this evening. I have been a member of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs for quite some years and have contributed uh, in various ways to their publications. So uh, this is not an environment which I feel is very strange, because obviously there's quite a, a family feeling between the Institute of International Affairs and the different parts of the world. Uh, so it was, it was in a sense with some interest that I responded to Jeff's invitation to come uh, to talk to you. And clearly I was going to want to talk about some of the things which have been relevant uh, in my career, both currently, which as Jeff has mentioned, as Executive Director of the Asian New Zealand Foundation, but also previously uh, when I was in Defence and in Foreign Affairs and in various parts of the world. And in fact, it's, it's lovely to see here people who have dissented with my career at, uh, at various stages, including some alarmingly long ago. So that will probably limit what I can, what I can say about some of those earlier experiences. Uh, Jeff, of course, cunningly extended this invitation last year, at which time my 2013 calendar looked rather empty. Uh, this actually is no longer the case, but happily I was still able to keep this fixture in my schedule and thus to be uh, with you this evening. Jim also gave me a very wide range of topics to choose from, and I've taken him at his word as the title of this address indicates. But I probably should have added a question mark at the end of the title. Uh, it talks about peace and prosperity, and they are both legitimate and natural aspirations for the international order, but they are not to be assumed. We have to work to create and sustain them. And what I wish to do this evening is to provide you with my views on how we can do so and to do that from a New Zealand perspective. And Jeff will know better than most that that perspective differs in some respects from that of Australia or of Australians. 
My reference to the Asian century in my title is a deliberate reference to the white paper the Australian government issued last year, which uh, Jeff referred to in his introduction. While New Zealand's interaction with Asia obviously differs in scale and content from that of Australia, in many ways the challenges and opportunities that are set out in that paper are very similar to those that are presented to us. And some of the initiatives set out in that paper are ones which I recommend to the Foundation's board that we introduce to New Zealand. The Asian Century headline understates, as many have observed, some more critically than others, that Asia had been a reality in both our national lives for a very long time, indeed ever since we came to existence as modern nations. And perhaps here I can just put in a caveat. When I talk about Asia, you can mentally put in some inverted commas, because in a sense, Asia in itself is a construct, but it is a very convenient way of talking about uh, this adjacent part of the world. Even on a shorter time frame, and certainly for New Zealand, since the cataclysm of Britain's entry into the then European community, Asia has loomed larger and larger in our external profile. I was in Australia in the 1980s when Ross Garner produced Asia and the Northeast Asia Ascendancy. So one can understand the frustration of some who felt that this had all been said before. My own foundation was established in 1994 precisely to address what was then seen as a shortfall in our ability to operate effectively in Asia. So in a sense there is nothing new. Yet, Despite these very valid observations, the reality is, is that we constantly need to be reassessing our relations with Asia, not because we have been asleep on the job, but because Asia itself is changing more rapidly than we have always comprehended. That change is comprehensive, but let me identify three critical, what I see as three critical components of it. The first, and in a way the most obvious, is that Asia is getting richer but it's also getting richer faster. The statistics for this are legion. Let me just mention two. The economic transformation in India and China is happening at a scale and a pace unprecedented in history. Average incomes are growing at 10 times the pace and on more than 200 times the scale of the increase during Britain's Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution. And that revolution, secondly, is not confined to those two giants. For example, the proportion of Indonesians living in urban areas, a proxy for industrialization, could reach 71% in 2030, up from 53% today. Those figures, by the way, come from uh, Ken Henry's paper. Australia has been holding its own better than New Zealand, but for both of us, there has been a huge change in our relative position in world rankings of wealth since certainly my younger days. The second component is Asia is getting more powerful. Not just China and India, but all countries with increased wealth are devoting part of that to building up their military capabilities. It is natural that this is so, but it is also changing not only the global balance of power, but the balance of power within the region. And thirdly, the principal beneficiaries of these changes are the educated, prosperous members of society who now have the wherewithal to think and live in ways which we conventionally call middle class. Even if they are only a portion of the total national populations, the absolute numbers by our standards are staggering. The reason I want to highlight those three aspects of the rise of Asia is that we have to keep all three in the picture if we are to make an accurate assessment of what our future with Asia will be. It might be easiest to think about them as a triangle because they all do relate and reinforce one another while at the same time approaching from different angles. There is an obvious connection between wealth and power. Wealth is a necessity for power and power enables a country to protect its wealth. The relationship of the two has been a staple of Asian philosophy since the earliest records. It features in Swins as uh, art of war and was recycled by Japanese and Chinese thinkers in the 19th century. Rich countries, strong army being one such formulation, and there are equivalents in other cultures. This concept is probably more readily comprehended in this country than in mine, but it's absolutely vital that we do grasp its significance. For all the countries of Asia, whatever their history, increased wealth is both an end in itself, but also a means to ensure and enhance national power. These two dimensions then intersect with the third, the emerging middle classes and their aspirations for their children and their interest in overseas travel and their consumption patterns and their lifestyles are more like us. 
They are also, judging by my own experience, very committed to their respective national projects. Nationalism is alive and well in Asia, and as with most human phenomena, this has both a positive and a negative charge. So in sum, we have a region on our doorstep, which is growing more like us in some ways, with all the benefits that that brings in terms of exchanges of goods and services, people to people interactions, at the same time as it is creating its own mode of modernity. Modernization, we have realized that we have not already apprehended that through our knowledge of Japan, does not equate to westernization. This is the world in which we navigate. Everybody in our world wants peace and prosperity. Can we sustain or attain these together rather than through zero sub games? That seems to me to be the question. Prosperity is the easier nut to crack because inherently the creation of wealth provides more options. Put very simply, in New Zealand, and I guess here in Australia, we benefit very directly from Asia's prosperity. Ever since that cataclysmic event I referred to in 1972 with Britain joining the European community, a major theme of New Zealand's external policy has been to extend and deepen our economic interactions with key global markets. And this we have been successful if one simply compares the diversity of our trade patterns now with those of the early 1970s. And within that framework, Asia has taken an increasingly vital role. For New Zealand, this change has been very significant. During the time when I was ambassador in China, from 2001 to 2004, China was our fourth or fifth largest trading partner, the others being Japan, the US and Australia. In 2012, China is now our second largest part trading partner, with Australia still the first, I'm sure you'll be very relieved to know. And amongst our other leading partners, six of eight are in Asia, and all are in APEC except the United Kingdom. This is a seismic change, and on current projections, those patterns which are now seen are likely to continue for the foreseeable future. This pattern is reflected in flows of tourists, students, immigrants, although not an investment, the stock of which is still dominated by what we would call our traditional partners. We have a variety of free trade linkages with Asia, including bilateral agreements with China, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, and Hong Kong, and plurilateral agreements with ASEAN, with Australia as a partner, and with Brunei. On the horizon is the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the various initiatives taking place under the umbrella of the East Asia Summit. It would be reasonable to say that without growth in China and Australia, the New Zealand economy would have had a much more difficult time of it. And leaving aside the particularities of the global financial crisis, on any reasonable projection, the Asian economies will proportionately and absolutely play a larger and larger part in our lives. But they will not be alone. One of the features of the world which can sometimes get lost as we fixate our guys on the region to our north or northwest is that other parts of what was the developing world are getting richer too. In particular, Africa, which for so long seemed to be bypassed by the strong currents of economic growth, is now entering the fray, and some of its countries are now following the path of other emerging economies. This is good news for us and for Africa, of course. We have many eggs in the Asian basket, some very large eggs amongst them, but there are other baskets as well. On the other side of the ledger, what is happening in Asia is as of much interest in Europe and North America as it is to you and to us. The Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations in APEC before that reflect that level of interest for the United States and now Canada. The rather unwieldy ASEM to which we now both belong reflects a similar impetus from Europe. There is another grouping which links Asia and Latin America. Many of these groupings are aspirational but they manifest an important point that today's regional and by and large is open, not closed. This is excellent news for New Zealand. We are regionalism's outsider and stand to suffer if any part of the world turns it on itself. It is also a reflection of the more banal point that so many issues in the 21st century, whether climate change or human trafficking or whatever, can only be resolved globally and not regionally. The other conclusion to draw is that we do not have the Asian Pacific region to ourselves, if we ever thought we did. I was much struck by a reference in the Asian Century White Paper that a Minister of Education in Sweden suggested a year or two back that all Swedish school students should learn Chinese 
in addition, of course, to Swedish, English, and French or Spanish. We are not the only developed country seeking to ride the wave of Asian prosperity, and when some people question the ability of our curriculum to manage multiple languages, I think there are many examples we can point to of people surely not less more intelligent than us who actually do manage to do that and succeed very well at it. But by and large, the messages of what has been happening in the region economically are positive. Beyond that, we have goods, services, environments, ways of living, which increasing numbers of our neighbours to the north find attractive and wish to enjoy. We are innovative and creative. Our societies are again, by and large, open and welcoming to peoples from all over the world, whether it's tourists, students, investors, or immigrants. The English language and the transparent and accountable rule of law are huge and important assets for us. The diversity of the principal cities of Australasia is probably almost unprecedented, and yet our social cohesion remains strong. As I indicated earlier, when we turn to the political or to be a little more technical, the geopolitical order, we are faced with a different set of circumstances. I'm something of a historian by inclination, so forgive me if I turn the clock back at this point, not too far back, really only the length of that my lifetime that I suspect most people in this room looking around. Despite, despite what happened in Singapore in 1942, we, Australia and New Zealand, emerged as amongst the group of victors in World War II. The aftermath of that war, if not quite a restoration on the scale of the Congress of Vienna, did represent a return for us rather than a new beginning. It was the exact opposite for most of our northern neighbours. Independence for India, Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Indonesia, a new and divisive beginning for China, rehabilitation for Japan, partition of Korea. All of these took place in the first six years after the end of World War II. These are ancient civilizations that newly constructed states. In comparison, although we may not think of it much like that, while our societies are new, politically we are old. The New Zealand Parliament first met in 1854 and has had an uninterrupted history ever since that can't be emulated by too many other parliaments in the world. It is not, must not surprising that some of the perspectives that we have differ from those in Asia and that this can represent a policy challenge. When we were writing our 2010 defence white paper, some parts were relatively easy. We knew what to say about the national defence of New Zealand. It did not differ from what we had said in many previous similar documents over several decades. We could not identify any direct threat to New Zealand's sovereignty, but there were a variety of ways in which encroachments could take place, such as in our maritime domain or through cyberspace. The capabilities military and other that we needed to deal with these were more of what we already had rather than being completely novel. We also had clear precedents for how New Zealand contributed to international forces in far flung parts of the world. We've been doing that for most of the 20th century and could readily forecast that there would be further such calls on our highly professional armed forces in the decades to come, even if we could not pinpoint exactly when or where. There was also plenty of precedent for how we would support our South Pacific neighbours. The interventions in Timor in 1999, Solomon's in 2004, Tonga in 2006, gave us ample material and more than just, by the way, some confidence from recent developments that such interventions can be successful. But in defence policy and security policy terms, the larger Asia-Pacific region was more of a conundrum. This is a region of immense importance to New Zealand, as I have already outlined. Increasingly, the major source of our wealth and prosperity. <coughs> Yet it would be a very, drawing a very long bow to suggest that what was happening in the region represented any direct threat to New Zealand. This simply would not be credible to our people. Equally, the Asia of today is not a theatre in which there would be much call for New Zealand forces to engage in the expeditionary assistance that has been such a strong feature of our military history and yours, including in Asia in the 1950s and 1960s. Asia is now a region of strong states, not weak states. States which are more than able to look after their internal and in most cases external security. States which are using their economic wealth to reposition themselves in the region and the world. Yet that we did, we decided at the same time we did not, and decided we should not, 
stand aside from the security challenges of the region and simply look at the region through an economic and trade lens. Quite apart from our continuing relationship with you through the Five Power Defence Arrangements, FBA with Malaysia and Singapore, we had a very direct interest in a region which was not only prosperous, but also peaceful and stable. This is not just because an unstable region would disrupt trade flows and thus affect our economic well-being, although that is important. At a more fundamental level, tension and conflict challenge the very premises on which our world operates. They are symptoms of something wrong in the global body politic. We cannot ignore them. And as a responsible member of the Regional and International Committee of States, we, New Zealand, saw ourselves as under an obligation to do what we could to sustain a stable and peaceful state of affairs. Are peace and stability threatened? Maybe not as such, but I would identify at least a range of risks. The growth of China, India and the other countries of Asia is, as I said, affecting the balance of our power in our region and globally. There has been much analysis, some of the most trenchant coming from Australia, of whether such shifts can be peaceful, almost always in a conflict, or simply in themselves presage a prolonged period of instability and uncertainty. Specifically, this then turns on the role and position of the United States as the incumbent power and of China as the strongest of the rising powers. And then secondly, within the region, there are a number of unresolved issues of sovereignty. Apart from the well-known situation of the Korean Peninsula and across the Taiwan Straits, there are islands and places which may not be important to themselves, by like some are, but they can readily become proxies for national rivalry, as we are seeing very recently indeed in the uh, East China Sea. There are risks flowing from divergent interpretations of the rules of the road, or maybe in this case of the high seas, or from the behaviour of trigger-happy local actors. If these are some of the risks that the region faces, what, though, can New Zealand do to mitigate them? In the 2010 White Paper, we set out a number of ways in which we could make a contribution. They range from supporting open and inclusive regional security and defence structures to being willing to assist in terms of natural and humanitarian disasters. While our military contributions will never be large in quality quantity, we do have high-performing assets and units which are able to make a significant and welcome contribution. The Special Forces are probably the best known of these, but equally valuable are our surveillance aircraft and frigates. A number of premises underline the sort of approach we took. One is that every nation has a place in the region, legitimate national security interests to protect, and a contribution to make the regional and global security. Policies premised on containing one country, be that China, or excluding another, be that the United States, are undesirable as well as plainly just unlikely to succeed. All countries have at their disposal rules and practices to deal with international disputes, ranging from the provisions of the UN Charter to those of the international law of the sea. While sometimes these provisions may seem to be honoured in the breach and not the observance, we should not lose sight of them. They were a major investment made after World War II to ensure that there should be no repetition of conflict in the world, and they are still a very valuable inheritance and asset. Transparency in military affairs is a powerful means of building mutual confidence, nonetheless, and regional security interests, sorry, regional security arrangements can do the same, although they cannot reach far beyond the political will of their constituent members. One of the most valuable initiatives in recent years which I was associated with was the establishment of what's called, somewhat cumbersomely, the ASEAN Defence Minister's Meeting Plus, or ADMN Plus, which brings together all the countries of the region, including ourselves and ourselves, and this year under Brunei's chairmanship is undertaking practical exercises and military cooperation. For our part, we maintain defence relations with nearly all the countries of the region, our defence relationships with the United States, which were long constrained for reasons which will be well known to this audience, are now in as healthy a state as they can be, given the policy differences which still exist. Singapore and Malaysia hold a special reason for the special position for the reasons I've mentioned, and in nearly everything we do in the region, we find ourselves alongside Australia. 
In other words, if I endeavour to sum up this picture, it is a region in which the opportunities from New Zealand's point of view do outweigh the risks. But we should not neglect the fact that the stability and peace of the region is something which does not happen as a matter of course. It is something which all the countries of the region have to work towards and make a contribution to. If we do, then I think we can be confident about the future that, that we have. In taking the approach, we are doing what most of our neighbours are doing, recognising that we have equities in all our relationships, albeit of different kinds, and that we do not want to find, for instance, that a burgeoning relationship with China inhibits us from a revitalised defence relationship with the United States, or vice versa. Keeping this balance may at times require determined optimism and hard work, but in my view, there is much to be referred to the alternatives. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the issue of development assistance the Pacific is, is an important one, but, and the range of development assistance, as, as your question reports, has obviously grown hugely in recent years, particularly uh, with China now becoming a more significant state government. Um, this is an area where, from New Zealand's point of view, we believe very strongly that it's, it's very important that aid donors coordinate and collaborate as much as possible, while obviously still maintaining their own uh, national objectives, and do so in connection with the governments, of course, to which they are offering assistance. And there are a variety of mechanisms uh, which are designed to achieve that. China is not part of all those mechanisms. It obviously is a dialogue part of the form and participates in other, other ways. We have a number of other channels in which we uh, talk to China about these matters, as I'm sure Australia does and other countries. And obviously, we at times have three-way conversations uh, with the Pacific countries. Uh, I think it was last um, September, and my colleagues may be able to correct me on this, where we announced a project between New Zealand, China, and the Cook Islands uh, with water, water uh, purification in Rarotonga. Um, so there are a variety of instruments that, that can be used, but the re I think we have to recognise the reality is that the range of actors in the South Pacific is increasing and is likely to increase. And I think from the point of view of the South Pacific governments, that's that probably a good thing. And we need to recognise their own interests and, and the approach that they wish to take to these matters, because I'm sure they're not particularly wanting to hear New Zealand or Australia telling them, you know, do this or don't do that. So there is a very heavy emphasis, in my view, on dialogue, both bilateral, uh, you know, regional, Australia adopting the New Zealand option, 
which he's polite enough that he's saying that my presence to quickly apologize and say he doesn't really mean to insult us. Um, but uh, there are significant differences in the way in which New Zealand and Australia interact with the world simply as a function of the different sizes of our economy, of our defense forces, and of many other things. The point I was wanting to make in this paper is that despite those differences, we are in a sense looking out the same world. We both have a huge interest in it working successfully. And we will be picking our way through the sort of policy issues that are represented, for instance, by the current issue at play between China and Japan. Both of those countries are hugely important to us. They're both very important to Australia. You want to be in a very short position of consistency as to, uh, in a sense, the position you might take when issues flare up between two countries. I've made one uh, term, interesting terminological observation. Uh, we always generally talk about the South Pacific, whereas in Australia we generally talk about the South West Pacific. And most of the time I don't think people even notice that we use different terms and uh, it is a reflection of a slightly different geographical perspective that we're using. But that aside, I tend to be a bit weary of what I would call sort of essentialist interpretations of uh, national behaviour. You know, because New Zealand is New Zealand, because Australia is Australia, different things happen. Uh, different things happen. I prefer to uh, think about it in terms of different national endowments and different ways that governments have to conduct their affairs. And clearly, as I said in response to the earlier question, you know, our economies are different, our demographics are different, the amount of heat we have in the world is different. So that there are going to be different harmonics in the relationships which take place between New Zealand and a set of countries and Australia and a set of countries, really regardless of the behaviours or particular perceptions of Australia or New Zealand officials and, and, and government ministers. And uh, I, I don't think that's a problem. I think it's in fact part of the uh, richness of this part of the world that there are two countries like ours which are very similar but actually also take uh, different approaches. There is, a, I would agree, there is a demographic element which does play out. Um, uh, the High Commissioner would be much better way to speak about this than I can, but our, our armed forces have a very high component of Maori and other uh, populations in them. I think that does have a, have a, have a play through in terms of this. But I wouldn't want to overstate that. I mean, the Australian forces have been very effective on the Pacific, have been very welcome, and have done very good things. So sometimes those are comments which are made uh, uh, more at the margin. And as your um, example of Fiji attests, we do uh, invest an enormous amount of effort in coordinating and talking about our respective Pacific policies. Uh, we never especially want to surprise the other country with something happening which they weren't aware of. At the same time, we may well take different approaches. In Fiji, I think we have seen that issue very much in the same way. And that obviously remains a challenge uh, for the future. The point I was making in, in, in this paper, and I would say it is still valid, is that for the United States, what is happening in this part of the world is hugely important to its national security and its national future. And I do not think that whatever particular visits are made or whatever you know, discussions are held, but that will disappear. So I think it's just too important for the United States to uh, not, not to be giving it the attention that was demonstrated uh, in, in the recent administration. So while there may well be uh, fluctuations from time to time, I'd be very, very uh, surprised if, if the eye was to away from this region for very long. In terms of the United States overall, I think this is just too, too far to a part of the part of the world, but at the same time they are a global power, they have responsibilities in, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Africa and Latin America and elsewhere, and they have to just do what all of us do, but on a rather larger scale, which is to find ways of prioritizing and, and balancing those, but I don't think it will be that you will find that this, this region disappears off the US radar screen anytime soon.
I, I really think that it's not a question I want to comment on, but I want to explain why, rather than just say I want to comment. I mean, I think the relationship between Australia and the US is one which is highly central and quite sensitive in Australian politics. It's one in which there is a significant difference with New Zealand. I think, therefore, that there's a risk that any New Zealander commentating on it, that looks as if somehow or other we're trying to say, go our way or whatever, which we would never, ever want to be doing. And uh, so it, it's just not an area that I think is very sensible for me to offer a, a response.